Ever since the 19th century, the Qing hadn't really fared too well. Where China, for millennia, was the center of not just Asia, but realistically, the entire world, they had all too suddenly been eclipsed and bullied around by European powers, losing many core Chinese territories in the process. But now, this instability is going to overflow, as you'll soon see. In this series of videos, we will explore pretty much every border shift during the Chinese warlord era, starting here in 1910. Now this map is quite complicated, so let me clarify a bit. These states are what are known as Mongol banners. Essentially, Mongol reservations with large degrees of autonomy. They would subject themselves to Chinese rule, but for most of Qing rule, it would be illegal for the Han Chinese to settle into. This would change around the 1880s due to foreign pressure, leading to a mass migration of Han into the region. Now this specific subject is a unique one, being the Kumul Khanate, generally recognized as the final legitimate heir to Genghis Khan's Mongol Empire, ruled by a true Genghisid. These other subjects are known as Tusis, which is a title awarded to tribal leaders and small kingdoms in the Tibetan Plateau and southern China to lords subjecting themselves to Chinese rule. These final subjects are Tibetan principalities, which we'll come back to very soon. The rest are direct Chinese provinces under rulership of the Emperor of the Qing. With that explanation done, strap yourselves in, we're going to be doing a very, very detailed dive into Chinese history here. We start with an uprising in Tibet. Tibet used to be ruled in a similar fashion to the Tusis or the Banners with their own special status. But after a temporary British occupation in 1904, the Tibetans have asserted more and more independence over the Qing, leading to this rebellion in the Kham region of Tibet. In response, the government of Sichuan, Zhou Erfang, invaded Tibet, taking control himself, also forcing tribute from the smaller Tibetan states in the region. While we're on the subject of Tibet anyway, the small state of Bhutan across the Himalayas also controls these little enclaves in western Tibet. Not really relevant to our story right now, but still an interesting fact. Now during this period, the Chinese government were selling ownership over the nation's railways to foreign companies in what's known as an extraterritorial scheme. Essentially, meaning that Chinese law no longer applied over the railways purchased. This would lead to the emergence of the railway protection movement in central China, who were very, very opposed to these sales. The movement was strongest in the Hubei province, which would see revolutionaries prepare for action when in Wuchang, the provincial capital, revolutionary forces had an accidental bomb explosion. When the police came to arrest the men, they discovered a much larger revolutionary plot and the situation would devolve into street fighting in the regional capital. The rebels would then manage to capture Li Yuanhong, the military governor of Hubei, who they would force to switch sides and call for other governors to revolt as well, while establishing the Hubei military government. Li's men soon began to march in two directions, north towards Shang and south into Hunan. Hunan would declare their support for the revolution, proclaiming their own military government, while the Qing would attempt to relieve the siege of Shang. Upon their failure, the Shenxi would form their own military government as well. Neighboring Shanxi would do the same under Yan Xishan, a political rock star during the warlord period, as the dominoes really began to fall for the Qing. The next day, Yunnan would revolt and expel Qing forces, followed by Jiangxi and pro-revolution revolts across China's southern cities. In response to these revolts, Zhejiang, Anhui and Jiangsu would also join the revolution, soon after joined by Guizhou as well. Now, while all this was going on, the Qing were not just watching their empire fall apart idly. They attempted a counterattack into the central eastern provinces. This would prove to be a disaster, as the Qing's main armies were encircled in Anhui. In the south, Guangxi would declare their own independence as well, followed shortly after by Guangdong. The revolutionaries would then launch an invasion of Fujin, leading to pretty much all of the south now falling into revolutionary hands. Sorry for the quick intermission, but by far most of you aren't subscribed. To keep up to date with the two videos I release every single week, consider doing so. Thank you. Shandong would break away next, putting the revolutionaries dangerously close to the Qing power base in the north. The region of Ningxia would then separate themselves from the larger Gansu province, aligning themselves with the revolutionaries as well. 
In Tibet, a rebel general broke away from the empire as the revolutionaries started an invasion of the Sichuan province. As the warlord marched east though, he would find his Tibetans holding revolt coming under the control of Tibetan rebels. The Chinese rebels would be successful in gaining complete control over the Sichuan province. Now it's important to note that the emperors and the upper class of the Qing were Manchu people, a previously nomadic population group from Manchuria, who managed to conquer all of China. In retaliation for what the Han saw as centuries of Manchu oppression, the Manchu people were being expelled from revolutionary held provinces. This led to fears in Outer Mongolia that in the case of a revolutionary victory, Han settlers may come to overrun the Mongol banners. This would lead to most of the Outer Mongol banners declaring a provincial Mongol government. The city of Urga, today's Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia's capital, would initially remain under Qing control, but was soon overran by Mongolian forces. The south coast of Manchuria would then see an uprising as well, but the Qing would manage to break this revolt by employing bandits like Zhang Zhaolin to suppress the rebellion. Back over in Tibet, a new revolt would declare the kingdom of Powo. At this point, revolutionary leader Sun Yat-sen had arrived in the eastern city of Nanjing and was declared the provincial president of the newly established Republic of China. This would officially merge all the various provincial governments established during the revolution. Meanwhile, in the western province of Xinjiang, the Uyghurs would attempt to achieve independence in a similar vein to Mongolia. As Yang Jinxing, the government of the province, attempted to deal with this revolt, he was distracted by the Mongolians capturing Uliatsi, soon after officially proclaiming the restoration of the Mongol Empire, led by the religious leader of Mongolian Buddhism, who was pronounced as the Bog Khan. Governor Yang attempted to march into Mongolia to break their independence, but his forces would be repelled by the Mongolians. This would lead Tuva Uriankai to also declare their independence. But while all this was going on, the main civil war has remained stable. Why? Because a ceasefire was signed, spurred on by the British leading an embargo and blockade on the Chinese nation, demanding the unrest be solved. This made a long-term civil war unmaintainable for both sides, and thus, compromise would be reached. The Qing Empire was to reform itself into a constitutional monarchy. This deal, however, would soon fall through as the revolutionaries unilaterally declared Sun as the president. This would lead to an alternate deal between Yuan Shikai, the leader of the Baijiang army, and Sun. The deal would entail Sun abdicating the presidency in favor of Yuan, and in exchange, Yuan would force child emperor Puyi to abdicate ending the Qing Empire. Following this, we would see the reunification of China under the leadership of Yuan Shikai, who would soon after crush the Uyghur rebellion as well. With this, the revolution was successful, the Qing were no more. Still, not all is as it seems. Beneath the surface, China actually looks more like this, far from being united, as we enter the prelude to China's warlord era. All of the governors officially recognized Yuan Shikai's government, but for all intents and purposes, they acted as independent political entities. In the next episode, releasing next week, we will follow China's territorial development during this era of Yuan Shikai's presidency, looking at his initial successes, his biggest mistakes, and the true start of China's warlord era as he passes away. I hope you'll join me then. But that's where I'll end this video. Thank you all for watching, consider leaving a like and a comment to support the content, and subscribe for two more videos every single week. To continue watching, click on one of the two videos on screen now. Again, thank you all for watching, and goodbye.